There are six times as many pilots and 12 times as many planes per capita in Alaska than any other state. Now, if you think about it, this makes sense. Most of the state is inaccessible any other way. Also, Alaska attracts the bold and independent, people who fulfill their sense of adventure flying the wilderness. We're about to meet a group of interior Alaska pilots who will share with you their love for flying. The first airplane flight in Alaska took place in 1913 in Fairbanks. A bunch of promoters decided to get together and have a big 4th of July celebration, so they hired James Vernon Martin, his wife, Lily, and their airplane to come up to Fairbanks and fly for them. Promoters were going to charge $250 a head for a bleacher seat, but now the folks in Fairbanks decided they could see the flight just as well sitting on their roof or any other high spot around town, and that's what most of them did. Martins flew round and round and round Fairbanks. You've got to realize this was just 10 years after the Wright brothers' initial first flight. Skeptics in Fairbanks, though, were convinced that manned flight was possible. Actually, there was one earlier manned flight in Alaska. A balloon flew in Juneau in 1899 at the 4th of July celebration. It was inflated from the heat of a wood fire built on the ground. And you know, that desire to float in the air and to feel the freedom of flying is still very much alive in Alaska today. You can think of any other kind of aircraft, really, whether it be a helicopter or a plane. And there's a lot of vibration, mechanical vibration, that uh, is disturbing. And it's going so by so quickly. Here you're moving as part of the air, two, three, four, five miles an hour, and it's there's just no other system of flying that allows that. 1967, as you might remember, was a centennial purchase year for Alaska. And that meant there were all kinds of events going on in virtually every city in the state. Well, Fairbanks' solution to that was to have what was then called Alaska Land, or A67, actually. And now it's called Alaska Land. They decided to bring a balloon to Alaska and they needed somebody to learn how to fly a balloon. And through a series of happenstance and good luck, I was asked if I would like to fly a balloon. So I took about 22 and a half seconds to say yes, and uh, I got into a training program that summer and flew virtually every day up until the flood washed everything out. Actually, I had a little bit easier then uh, the students that I put through the program now because a rather prescribed program it takes anywhere from 10 to 20 hours of actual flying time and for every hour that you have in the air you perhaps have uh, 10 or 15 or more on the ground well it's uh, everything involved with the balloon you know it's it's a fun event it's always an event so when um, you finally get to go flying being part that's of what's it. fun <laughs> yeah you always treat your ground crew with reverence and respect. <laughs> they might quit on you. <laughs> you. Lay out the fabric and attach the basket to the balloon and then start a ground inflator. This will give you an initial cold bubble of air. Once that is inflated, fabric up out of the way, then you turn your in-flight burners on, and this will start to cause the balloon to rise. And once you're at that point, it, it hardly takes five minutes, really. forward. Beautiful. This 
Pearl Creek area is sort of a central point. We can literally go in any direction and have reasonable places to land. I've heard uh, references to it being religious, it being sexual, it being whatever you want it to be. Uh, I just it thoroughly enjoy it, really. It, it's a, it's a, a break from things that you usually do, and it demands really 100% concentration. Probably the most famous of the Alaska Flyers was Carl Ben Eilson. Many others flew more than he did, but he showed the possibilities. He was a former Army Signal Corps pilot who came to Fairbanks in 1922 to teach high school English, but what he really wanted to do was fly. In July of 1923, he made the first commercial flight from Fairbanks to Nanana, and then in 1924, he talked the post office into a mail service contract. They sent him a de Havilland and agreed to pay him $2 a mile to fly the mail from Fairbanks to McGrath. No one had ever flown in Alaska in winter before. A heavy set of skis was carved for the plane, and in February 1924, Allison made the first airmail run in Alaska. Mail that had been carried for days or weeks by dog sled could now be delivered in a matter of hours. Well, as it turned out, he cracked up his plane three out of the eight runs he made, and the post office canceled his contract but he'd made a name for himself. In 1928, with the Hubert Wilkins expedition, he became the first to fly over the North Pole from Point Barrow to Spitsbergen, Norway. Later again with Wilkins, and joined by Joe Crossan, he explored Antarctica by air. Another great of the Alaskan skies was Noel Ween. He came to Alaska in 1924 at the age of 25 to fly for Jimmy Rodebaugh in the Fairbanks airplane. Right away, Ween made the first flight from Anchorage to Fairbanks. It took him three hours and 45 minutes to cover the same route that took two days by train. In the next few weeks, he pioneered bush flying, ferrying people and supplies to and from remote mining camps and villages. In 1926, Ween made the first commercial flight to Nome. He flew a Fokker F3 with an enclosed passenger cabin but an open cockpit. An Alaska railroad porter gave the flight an honorary send-off before crowds of well-wishers. Well, a storm front forced him to land in Ruby, where he flipped the plane upside down, but repairs were made in a few days, and he still completed the trip much quicker than the route could have been traveled by boat. In later years, Ween and his brother started Ween Airlines, first operating out of Nome, but eventually headquartered in Fairbanks. The chief pilot for Pan American he said, I used to work for Ween. He says, I was happier flying the dog team trails than I am now that I'm chief pilot. He says, if I was you, I'd resign and go to work for a little outfit and grow with them. So I did. I resigned, gave up seven years seniority, went to work for Ween, and right away, within two years, I was flying all the routes as a captain. And you can't beat that for an outfit when you're just starting in. I'd make two trips a day from Anchorage to the North Slope and back, and sometimes you could see the beautiful Mount McKinley out there. That was always nice to see that. And uh, when we'd start our descent to Anchorage or descent into Trudeau Bay or Dead Horse Wire, I'd fly him a little tune on harmonica over the public address system. I remember Governor Egan, he, he used to want me to play for him. And uh, we had F-27s then, and then he'd say, George, play me some mountain music and the only thing I could think of that was like mountain music was uh, springtime in the Rockies and it seemed like that number worked out really well and he got a kick out of listening to springtime in the Rockies and I got a kick out of playing it and I guess the past just finally got so they kind of expected it too. Alaska honors its pioneer aviators. Eilson Air Force Base was named after Ben Eilson as was Mount Eilson in Denali National Park. Here in Fairbanks, the Borough Library is named after Noel Ween. This is Weeks Field. In its day, this is one of the most important airports in all of Alaska. Over there is the old ballpark. That's where Ween and Nielsen took off on their historic flights. Now in those days, the runway didn't reach much farther than here. 
1938, though, Howard Hughes was doing his around-the-world flight, and they lengthened this runway in order to accommodate his Lockheed Lodestar. Then it was a mile long and reached all the way down to the Chena River. Weeksfield Airport closed in 1952 when Fairbanks International Airport opened. It's a neighborhood now and a park. The building that was once the main hangar for Pacific Alaska Airways is now a bowling alley. It was bush flying that really opened up Alaska's interior. Small planes ferrying supplies and people to villages and mining camps, just about any place with a gravel bar, lake, or river. The late 20s and 30s saw many new flying spaces. Weeksfield was lengthened, new hangars were built, and business was good. The small airline started by the Wien brothers grew from small planes to large cargo and passenger planes to modern Boeing 737s. Eventually, however, they could no longer compete with outside airlines. In the 80s, Wien finally went out of business. But there are still many small airlines in Alaska providing a lifeline to remote areas. If they hadn't had bush flying, well, bush flying had to be invented. <laughs> it was probably invented up here as much as anywhere. And uh, so the, uh, the way in which the airplane was used to haul everything under the sun. If you read Gene Potter's The Flying North, and some of the cargoes that they show being loaded into airplanes are incredible. <laughs> Just, they had cows, and they had, they had pigs, and they had pianos. And everything under the sun flew in those days. And other means of transportation were not existent if you had to do it overland. You know, at, at a dog team pace, you would never have explored a lot of the, that country up here. I was flying with my dad in his airplane. I was sitting next to him, and he said, well, daughter, would you like to fly? And I looked at him, and I thought, I thought to myself, yes, but knowing my father, I better darn well know what I'm doing with that airplane. So I said, well, no, not right now. I went back home. I was living in Wisconsin at that time. Got my private pilot's license. Came back to Alaska, and I said, Dad, can I borrow the keys? I knew I wanted to fly that day when Dad offered me the opportunity to fly his airplane. I'd like to welcome you as pioneers of Alaska. We are delivering the mail. We're taking a lady to Beaver. This is a, it's a service. It's like a taxi service with wings. That's how we get around in Alaska. There are no roads that are going to where we're going today. Okay, we've been cleared for takeoff. Please double check your seatbelt. Sure Today's a real combination flight. We've had mail, passengers, cargo, and we also have a couple of tourists. As I mentioned to the people as we left, this is not a tourist flight, but they're welcome to come along and see what flying in Alaska is really like. I appreciate uh, people's pioneer spirit when they come up and fly with us, because it is a real part of Alaska. We need to take a good look at the runway. A lot of times there'll be animals on the runway. And some villages, they'll use the runway for a ball field. He should be back here doing this, man. Alaska is serviced pretty much by airplane. There's very few roads. Everything is flown in. And uh, if the weather is such that we cannot fly. That means that these people do not receive mail and groceries for that time that we cannot fly. Christmas presents, Christmas might even be delayed a few days because the weather is bad and we cannot fly into here or the other outlying parts of Alaska. Here 
in Alaska, you get to know the people. Alaska is a very large state, but it's also very small population-wise. So you get to know the people in the villages, and it, uh, it would be a lot different in the states, and the airplanes just aren't utilized near as much. Okay, we will. Good meeting, Richard. the buildings here in Venati, other than the log cabins, that was all brought in by airplane. This river out here is not deep enough like the Fort Yukon River to have barge, barges supply materials up here. So everything, including the four-wheelers you see, is brought in. It's all brought in by airplane. So the aircraft dropped off soda pop. Soda pop is flown in. That's how they get it. Everything is flown in. Today's assignment, we carried mail to Beaver in Fort Yukon and picked up a passenger to Venati. This is really the lifeline to the villages. I'll get right up above the treetops and we'll just skim along there. See, there's absolutely nobody living here at all. This is moose country. My preference is just to be trim, uh, skimming treetops and that gives you a limited radius. Of course, the higher you get, why the more of an overall view that you get. And much above, oh, what, a thousand feet or so, it's pretty hard to be totally aware of uh, depth perception. So I'll kind of skim along and do something that you can't do with a regular airplane at all. <laughs> so the object is to look at the next set of trees coming up and tweak the burner just to get that tiny increment of correction. I'm surprised we're moving as fast as we are here. There just uh, is no significant air movement at all in the treetops but yet we're moving out, you know, faster than you can walk, so it's about five miles an hour. Look at what we're experiencing here, really. This is, this is just an exhilarating experience, as far as I'm concerned, to be able to do this. It's something out of a dream, really. You just can't duplicate this any other way. Because of its location, which is both exotic and strategic, many famous people have visited Alaska. Charles Nan Lindbergh stopped in northern and western Alaska in 1931 as they flew from New York to Asia. Howard Hughes stopped in Fairbanks on his record-setting round-the-world flight in 1938. The renowned aviator Wiley Post, who had been through Alaska twice before on round-the-world flights, and his friend, the humorist Will Rogers, stopped in Fairbanks on their way north. They were killed when their plane crashed just short of Point Barrow. And Russian pilot Zygmunt Levonetsky flew through Fairbanks on his Pioneer flight from Los Angeles to Moscow in 1936. Zygmunt Levonetsky was a, uh, a Russian pilot that was quite famous over in his country on doing uh, what we call exotic things. He was no more or less known as the Lindbergh of Russia. In 1936, he went to San Diego and bought a consolidated uh, aircraft on floats and flew it into Fairbanks and landed at Harding Lake. 
And uh, from there, he went on over the pole to Moscow. In 1937, he wanted to make another trip from Moscow nonstop to Fairbanks and then on uh, to the lower 48. He was in an AN-209 at that time, a four-engine uh, uh, bomber with liquid-cooled engines. Uh, they were gas models. We thought at one time they might have been diesels, but they were gas. And the last report they heard of him, he was on course, but he was 400 miles off the coast of Alaska, and the radio signal was picked up by a radio operator in Point Lay. They tried to get him to answer back, and they were never able to get another signal out of the, the, air, of the transmitter from Levineski. And, of course, we've never heard of the airplane since. Some pilots who came to Alaska in the early days didn't stay long. Alaska was a dangerous place to fly, he said. And they were right. Many pilots stayed and found out the hard way. Crack-ups and crashes were not uncommon. In 1929, Ben Allison died in an airplane crash. 1930, Ralph Wien was killed when his plane went down in Kotzebue. In fact, in the book Sourdough Sky by Mills and Phillips, there's a list of Alaska's 100 airmen naming the early flyers of Alaska. 26 of those 100 are known to have died in plane crashes. The same engine in those days that put out 200 horsepower, by the end of World War II, we were pulling over 300 out of the same engine with no change in design hardly. Also, remember this too, all of those airplanes in those days were basically open cockpit. Can you imagine flying open cockpit in this country at 40 below zero? You've got to be tough. One day I was trying to take off my Stinson Reliant loaded and I come up onto one of these cat trails that I was going across at about a 15 degree angle. I thought, oh no, I'm going to be in serious trouble here. And I tried to get in the air with it and I needed another five knots. You could usually pull them into the air at about 63 with a full load. I needed 65 or something like that. I tried to get airborne so that I get across the cat ruts. But when my right ski got into one of those ruts and it wanted to take off of the boondocks and it twisted my ski pedestal around and the ski went up and it didn't hit the propeller but the shock cord pulled it up and it flew crazy, you know. I, I was just in the air and I saw like a couple of kids on a teeter-totter. I didn't want to touch down again. I was trying to stay in the air and I could just hang into the air with it with this ski sticking out like that. I said, well, this is the first one. I knew it was coming sooner or later. They say you got to wreck at least two to be a qualified bush pilot. And I said, Jesus, I hope I don't wreck this too bad, but I got to put it somewhere. Where am I going to put it? And then I got to think, there's a chance that if I can find a windswept place on the ice where the wind blows on the cusp of the if I got glare ice there, I can set it down, and I got a chance because it'll slide. So I held the power on it, and I come in with flaps and everything, and I put her on the one ski and held her up as long as I could. And, then, of course, you know, as soon as you slow down a little, it's going to go over on the other. And I chopped the mixture control and the ignition and all that stuff and hoped I'd get away with this. And I was overjoyed to find out that the tie-down ring way out the wingtip, you can see the little tie-down ring there? It was just like a roller skate wheel, only that it wouldn't turn. See, and, and when I come in and the ski folded up and everything, the wing went down and that little tie-down like a roller skate wheel, it was the right position, you know. And it slid along in the ice and made a little white line forever, you know, while it swung around and held the wing up. There was a quarter of, a quarter of an inch of daylight under the tip of the wing, and it didn't wreck the airplane. My name's Jim Leonelli. I'm the director of operations for the 168th Air Refueling Squadron at Ielson Air Force Base, uh, Alaska Air National Guard. My name is Bob Edgett, and uh, I'm a tech sergeant, a boom operator, instructor in the Alaska Air National Guard. Uh, it's a pretty important job. We carry gas. We're flying gas station. To me, uh, flying is, is, is a serious business, okay? And I, I approach it in, in a uh, professional manner. I've been flying airplanes for 20 years. I've lost uh, uh, a roommate in Vietnam. I've got uh, some 15, 1600 hours combat time goes back to Vietnam. Uh, of course, I was in Desert uh, Shield, uh, been over there. This airplane, in fact, has a number of uh, 
missions in Saudi Arabia. I wanted to be a boom operator since I was a kid, so uh, uh, I grew up uh, partially in the Air Force. My dad was in there, and I used to like to go into the tankers during the air shows and lay back in the boom pod. And so I wanted to be a boom operator since I was a kid, and uh, then I got to join the Air Force, and that's what I've been doing ever since then. Initially, when it started out, was it was a thrill as a young person to get up there and, and uh, soar uh, the surly bonds. And then uh, later on, you know, just the, the sheer enjoyment uh, of flying. I enjoy getting up every day and going to work. They have to really trust us. We're their eyes in the back. They don't know what's going on back there. They can't see what's going on back there. So we're really responsible for our aircraft and for the receiver pilot. Our navigator clears them over to us. Uh, then we get in touch with them on the radio. We clear them up to us. A bomb, Chena 7 tanker, here, here. He comes up, and what he does, he just gets his plane stabilized behind us, and he gets all settled in his seat. And as he comes up uh, close enough, we extend our boom uh, into the uh, receptacle, making a contact. It is dangerous uh, when you have two airplanes in that close proximity. Uh, flying anywhere between 300 miles an hour to 500 miles an hour, uh, depending on the type of receiver that you have. And uh, accidents can happen. Uh, so it is a very critical job. It is a job that uh, is, takes a lot of safety involved. Hey, when you first go through boom school, it's a little difficult, a little scary. Uh, you get used to it like a regular job, any other job. Well, sure, there's always an element of danger, you know, anytime. You you, you fly a, an airplane, uh, you, when you drive a, a vehicle down a highway, there's element of danger. So, but I consider flying safer than driving a car down the streets of Fairbanks. I think for me, the rewards of watching uh, my career develop from a second lieutenant uh, to the job I have to, to the new guys coming on board and uh, watching them grow. You know, it's, it's like raising a family. To me, I, I have a large family uh, in North Pole, and to me, I have a large family out here. And watching these, uh, these young kids uh, increase their flying proficiency, that's really a, a, a reward for me. Setting flights of the Lindberghs, Wiley Post, and the Russian Levinevsky and others showed America that the rest of the world was only hours away, not days or weeks as it used to be, and the shortest air route to Asia and Russia was through Alaska. Suddenly, the territory took on military importance. Army bases were built in Anchorage and Fairbanks. Ladd Field, now Fort Wainwright, opened in 1940 as the home of a thousand planes. And the Lend-Lease program, which provided planes to Russia, led to the creation of the Alaska-Siberian Air Route. Planes were flown from the United States to Alaska, where they were met by Soviet pilots who flew them on to Russia. Military operations brought new flyers north. Many of these found a new home in Alaska. Yeah, we got up here in 47, and this was at the time of the GI Bill. If you uh, recall the end of World War II, they had a GI Bill, and, and under it, um, people who'd been in the service could learn to fly. That was one of the, they, you could go to college, you could learn to fly, you could do a lot of things with a GI Bill. So a lot of us, with instructor's ratings, were flying madly, training all these GIs who wanted to become pilots. And uh, sometimes it was hair-raising, and sometimes it was fun, and sometimes it was just funny. <laughs> I got a wire saying that uh, this, person who bought the planes was going to start a flying school, top of the world flying school. <clears throat> they said if I would like to, they'd pay my way up. I'd have a round trip ticket, and if I didn't like it, I could come right back. And uh, they guaranteed me students 24 hours a day. And at that time, I remember I thought, 24 hours a day? I wonder what they're talking about. That sounds kind of crazy. But it was summertime, it was June, and when I got here, and of course it was daylight all night, it was 24 hours a day. 
and there were a lot of people here that were interested in flying. The fellow said, well, I want a little duel. Sign me up for some duel. Well, I want some duel, too. How about me? I want some duel. So anyway, I signed up with her to get some duel. And then we you had... You wanted a, to solo, that's what Yeah, I wanted to solo. I'd been flying quite a bit, and I'd been flying bootlegging it without any certificate. But it would be nice to have her name on the certificate. So finally she did sign me off, and away I went. And I, I've been going ever since. And so the, the reason he married me is to get his flying time free, though. So, you know, it was expensive back then. This is a UH-60 flight simulator. It uh, gives us a chance to practice emergency procedures, other things we couldn't do normally in the aircraft because of safety requirements. We've got weekly periods. Usually uh, on Friday, we have two periods for our uh, platoon of Blackhawk pilots, so uh, usually once or twice anyway a month. It's got a number of hydraulic jacks, system that uh, moves the box around. Uh, inside we have big TV screens that allow us to uh, get visuals, and also we can set up instrument procedures, uh, all sorts of things. You get all the movement that you'd feel, uh, pretty much all the movement that you'd feel in the aircraft itself. Uh, pitch, roll, bank, up and down. It uh, shakes you around when you uh, do erratic maneuvers, when you land a little too hard. And uh, it's really very authentic in the way it reproduces what we do. It gives you a good chance to experience those things that hopefully you'll never have to experience in the helicopter. Maintenance troubles mostly. Um, things that happen uh, in the simulator that you can experience and then walk away from when it's done and, and uh, be finished with, uh, and things that normally wouldn't happen in a helicopter uh, are the things that we practice in there, just so when, if by chance they do happen, uh, we'll be ready for them, hopefully. Simulator is a lot of fun, yeah. It, it, it can be a lot of work because they can give you a lot of problems in there that uh, you don't normally experience when you're flying day to day. So uh, it can be a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun too. In my unbiased opinion, of course, I think this is the finest aircraft the Army has. Of course, I'll get an argument if I talk to somebody else. There, there are little uh, rivalries between different type aircraft pilots, you know, but uh, it's a great aircraft. I mean, it's, it's very versatile, it's very responsive, it's very powerful. And uh, if I had my choice to do it again, I'd still pick a Blackhawk. I'm, I'm very happy with it. The Blackhawk is the newest and best utility helicopter, lift helicopter, that the Army has right now. Uh, now, the Chinook guys will probably argue that point, but uh, there, there are quite a few things that the Blackhawk can do that the Chinook cannot do just simply because of its size. The Blackhawk uh, has available to it its, its controllability, it's small enough to get into tight spaces, and it's plenty powerful enough to be able to handle uh, the loads that would be required uh, for uh, support of the, uh, the division up here. We can lift uh, sling loads up to 8,000 pounds. It's a real workhorse, but it handles like a sports car, and that's why I like it. Okay, got two good start systems check. Bar 63, we're out of the avoidance. It's normal transmission oil looks good. Number one and number two, hydraulic pump caution lights are off. Back of the pump switch is auto. Hydraulic leak test systems check. We uh, divvy out the uh, view in front of us. Fire is still burning out there. Everybody has their area that they need to scan for other traffic and any type hazards. River's clear to the right. Clear left. Clear left. 
the closest calls that I've had here in Alaska have been with civilian aircraft, not other Army aircraft, uh, mostly because there is such an abundance of civilian aircraft, uh, float planes and such, flying in this, this uh, local area. But you just have to keep your head on a swivel, you know, and keep an eye out. Because we do fly so low and considerably fast to be so low, uh, you really have to be aware of the terrain. Something uh, very typical to Alaska here is that uh, uh, birds, eagles and such, we really have to be careful. They fly out of the treetops. Uh, we've not had a bird strike, uh, and we probably won't because uh, we are very cognizant of it. But uh, you have to be aware of your surroundings as far as uh, mostly the, the ground and the terrain, uh, vegetation and such, not to hit it. The excitement of flying is always there. I think all of us, that's why we're pilots. I mean, we, we enjoy to fly. But uh, the aircraft is so, oh, what's the word? So good that it, it really frees us up to think about the mission and, and concentrate on the mission. And uh, after a while, uh, the flying portion is really kind of second nature. In May of 1946, I was released and I got out of service and I had applied to SIG Wien for a job as a captain for Wien Airlines and I was accepted. So as soon as I got back, I went to work for Wien's as their captain in July 1946. We were not allowed to fly it while we were in the military because the military decided, I don't know for what reason, that they didn't have any facilities for women on the Northwest staging route, which took off at Great Falls, went up through Calgary and Edmonton Fort St. John, Fort Nelson, Watson Lake, and Whitehorse and Fairbanks. They, uh, so we had to turn the airplanes over to men at Great Falls. And it wasn't until after the war that um, Jenny Wood, who was then Jenny Hill, and I decided we'd like to get to Alaska. I called a friend of mine who was selling surplus airplanes and asked him if he had any planes to fly to Alaska. And he said, well, I happen to have one. Come on down. So I went down and met Jean Jack and he hired me on the spot and then i said well i have a friend could uh, she go with me and he said can she fly and i said sure he said so we went out and bought another airplane so we had three airplanes heading for alaska in the middle of winter in 1946. we took 27 days to fly 30 hours but the weather was terrible it was the worst winter alaska's ever had our cold spell for the, the longest cold spell that we've ever had uh, in Alaska started about mid-January of 1947 and lasted into the first week of, of February of 1947. We had 25 consecutive days. It was 50 below or colder. The temperatures in the town area here stayed between 52 and 58 below. And in the outlying areas, we had Task Force Frigid here at that time, and they hit temperatures down in the, in the low 70s. And during that period, we flew the barrel run every day, seven days a week, with no cancellations. Down where the International Airport is now, we had four CAA high-frequency transmission towers. They were approximately 300 feet high. They were always above the ice fog. So we decided to lay our approach for a week's field over those towers and plan around that. With the ADF tuned in to KFAR, which was the only broadcasting station we had at that time, you could take a heading of 330 degrees over the towers at 1,000 feet, 120 miles an hour, gear down, flaps 20 degrees, the ADF pointing directly to KFAR. You fly that for a minute and 20 seconds at 120 miles an hour. Do a single needle width turn to the right to the heading of 70 degrees. Throttle back, four inches of manifold pressure. Start your descend. 
and 57 seconds later you would be about 80 feet off the ground and right over the west end of Weeks Field. So then you look for the tracks in the snow through the ice fog and you dump it in and put it on the ground, put on the brakes, radio the Weeks Field Tower and tell them to send a vehicle out to lead you in. That's the way we made our landings every day for almost 22 days. Randy Acord was well suited for that cold winter. During World War II, he'd been stationed at Ladfield as a cold weather test pilot. You know, there's one thing that we've seen, and that is that there's all kinds of reasons why people like to fly in Alaska. But there's one thing that all pilots have in common, and that is they love what they do. In fact, some people like to fly just for the sheer joy of being in the air. Mostly it's a sense of freedom, and it's very aesthetically pleasing because it's quiet. You know, you just hear the wind whispering lightly or not so lightly if you're going faster. Um, it's about as close as you can get to being a bird. Uh, if you ever had a dream of flying, it's a lot like that in the sense that you're kind of like just up there like Superman or Superwoman and you're just floating along and uh, it's, it's hard to put words to. It just mostly feels very free to me. Peaceful. Now it doesn't take much strength to hold on, but the point is, is if we're flying along and I swing my leg, see how your legs fell out? That's a no-no. I want you to stick with me like glue. It's much easier when you're up there. Right. Things will definitely be easier in the air. You know how when you're first laid down, you were floating, mm -hmm. you know, in a harness? It'll be like that in the air. Right now, this platform is restricting my movement, and so we're kind of stuck here on this platform. Okay. Okay, so now let's try that again. If I swing, boom. If I move to the side, you come with me, okay? Am I kind of staying with you? Will that... Yeah, that was much Suffice. better. Okay. Now, you... let's go to cruise. I practice Tai Chi, like I'm a Tai Chi teacher, and that's why we have that yin-yang logo on the glider. Like Tai Chi and, and Taoism, which Tai Chi is the practice of, it's a matter of going with the flow. Life is uh, a bit of a roller coaster sometimes. It's a matter of balance. Life is a matter of balance, and that would be my essential philosophy, and I'd say hang gliding would be the epitome of that, because you literally have to be symmetrical and, and balanced, and you have to be attuned and uh, present with the moment of what's happening. So you're always trying to find that balance point and stay there with the minimum amount of effort. Because if you can just be real subtle and just make subtle changes with the glider, you'll be more efficient in the air and be able to sustain the flight longer and get higher and get higher faster, and everything works out better when you're gentle. I built this plane from scratch. Um, like I just started with the raw materials and built the, the whole thing. There were only a couple pieces that I bought pre-made. The engine mount, uh, the wing spars were already made, uh, then the obvious bolts and little fittings like that. But basically, I made everything on the plane. About 10 years ago, our son was born, and up to that had been just my wife and I. We had a Super Cub, and it was obvious the Super Cub was going to be too small. So I wanted, we wanted a little bigger airplane. And at the time, it seemed like a good idea to just build one. Well, it took a little longer than planned. I spent about six or seven years working on this plane. One of the things the FAA wants is for you to keep a record of the building project. The way I elected to do it was to start with a regular aircraft logbook and use a series of photographs with descriptions showing how things are going. Some of this book I'm sure will be very handy 10 years from now when I forget exactly where some pieces are inside that you don't see very often. The fuel lines, all the control cables, the rudder pedals are uh, and brake assemblies from a um, 
Cessna 150, uh, as are the seats, um, the top part of the seats. I had to build a lower structure. A picture of the ribs uh, that I made, starting to put fabric on the fuse or on the wings here. You just roll it along the wing, uh, gluing it at the edges. After it's glued in place, you take an ordinary iron, heat the fabric up to a certain temperature, and the fabric shrinks. It's, it's kind of like a drum, nice and tight. It's uh, Dacron, like your shirt is made out of. Um, not much thicker either. It's pretty thin stuff. To get the airplane approved to fly, I had to go to the FAA and show them my uh, records showing proving that I had built the aircraft for recreation and education, the way the rule reads. And then I had to fly it for 25 hours by myself in a small restricted area around town, uh, to the south of town, to prove that it was going to stay together, and that it had no um, undesirable characteristics. I enjoy flying. Flying's fun. Uh, it, for me, it's very relaxing. Uh, when I come home from work, sometimes, well, like any job, some days it's been a long day. And for me, it's, it's fun. It's very relaxing. I think it lowers my blood pressure to just go hop in the airplane and um, go fly around. Sometimes uh, I try to get out of town on weekends to go to my cabin, um, take uh, my kid fishing. I think like many pilots, most pilots, when I'm up in the air, I always watch the ground, um, all the hills, the lakes, trees, uh, the beauty of it all. I guess I just think about, uh, boy, it would be fun to go land on that lake and see what's there. Uh, it would be fun to go uh, through that mountain valley, through the next one, see what's on the other side of the hill. And I guess the usual question, what's on the other side of the hill, that everybody's asked since time eternal, I think. I guess some people have their four-wheelers four uh, or their river boats. Uh, I have an airplane. I had hoped to build it for under 10,000. I haven't added up all the receipts, but uh, I don't think I made that. It's probably closer to 15,000. You know, the $15,000 sounds horrible, but gosh, my last car, which was not a very um, fancy car by any means, cost pretty close to that. And this, this will last a lot longer uh, than my car will, I know that. I expect 30 years from now, this thing will be flying, looking just about exactly like it is right now. I can't think of a better place to fly. We have uh, a range of, you know, 50 miles, except south of the river, of course. We don't want to do that. And what looks like a limited road system, really, is rather generous. There are many open fields, so you have to walk 100 feet. That's fine. I'd much rather put up with that than to be downtown Anchorage somewhere. It's behind the trees now, but there is a structure, which is the observation point at the end of the nature trail at Creamers. Even this birch that we're flying over right now, if we had to, we could land in the middle of that and it won't hurt the balloon.
Yeah, see, now there's the viewing, Creamer's viewing spot there. No, that's, that's Joyce School. I've come up with cliches like it's a continuous parachute jump. The problem with a parachute is that it comes down, but this can go back up. And it's almost dreamlike to be floating along at treetop level, especially if there's a little bit of a push. And you just see things that you can't see any other way. I don't understand why more people don't fly, quite frankly, because it's such a wonderful experience. Wilbur Wright used to say that our love to fly came directly from our ancestors. They'd be crossing that endless trek and they would look up enviously at birds as they soared above obstacles. And you know, that could apply to Alaska. This land is so beautiful, the obstacles are so great, and people here so cherish their freedom and independence. The interior of Alaska would not be what it is without flying. Those who live in the bush, well, flying to them is a lifeline. To the military, it's a strategic terminal, giving us reach to all the northern hemisphere. And to everyone else that flies, it's a source of joy and giving us a broad new perspective on this beautiful land.